Hi, this is Susie Citron. It's uh, May 25th, 2005, and I'm interviewing Joel Tauber for our archival project, uh, our oral history project. Do we have your permission to use this tape in any way we see fit um, for the use by the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Detroit? Yes, you do. Thank you. Well, um, <laughs> let's start from the very beginning. Uh, I, I read a little bit about uh, the very beginnings that you had, but you want to describe uh, where you were born and a uh, little bit about your early family life and uh, where your parents were from? Sure. I was born in Detroit, 1935. Uh, my parents were second generation here. My grandparents came from Christnapolia, which was the old shtetls of <laughs> Eastern Europe, and my grandfather on the other side came from Kiev. Uh, my grandfather from Christnapolia was semi-Orthodox, and my other grandfather was probably extremely liberal. And much of their family were involved with the Communist Party back in the 20s and 30s, when it wasn't so bad. <laughs> I had a great upbringing as, uh, as a child, uh, and my parents always treated me with uh, uh, and gave me great responsibility uh, as I grew up. Uh, the story I like to tell is of early leadership because I'm one of those people that believe that really uh, uh, top leadership is a, is a born trait and very difficult if not impossible to train, whereas leadership, normal leadership, you can, you can train. And intermediate leadership, you can train. But I showed great leadership tendencies at age seven when I had formed a gang at McCullough Elementary School, oh, in the old Dexter Davison <laughs> uh, School. I lived in Buena Vista, where there were uh, probably 30 kids in our half block. So it was a wonderful upbringing. 95% Jewish, there were a few non-Jews on our block on Buena Vista. But I formed this gang and was picking on this uh, one uh, young man with my gang. And his mother came to school to complain. And so the principal called me in to his office with the other members of the gang and went over the accusations and said, okay, now who's the leader? And everybody pointed at me <laughs> and so they got to go, and I got to sit under the clock for the rest of the day. Uh, my early child, well, almost all the way through high school, I always was at odds uh, with the teachers. My grades were always very good, but I had a great deal of difficulty that now when I look back, it probably stemmed from boredom, but at that time, it was just hyperactivity. Uh, my mother taught in my elementary school. Uh, she was a literature teacher, and I say I spent about half my elementary school in her room because the other teachers used to send me there when <laughs> I got rambunctious. In uh, that trait, pretty much all the way through uh, high school, I went from McCullough to Durfee, uh, where most of the Jewish community was, and then we moved out north ended up at Post, uh, and then Mumford High School. Uh, Mumford was uh, a great joy for me. They were idyllic years. Uh, we were the first graduating class from the school, oh, really? and therefore we were seniors all the way through. Ninth grade, we were the oldest in 10th, 11th, 12th. Uh, we were the oldest class, and so there was great camaraderie in our class, which just had its 50th uh, anniversary and even among the teachers because they had all just come in brand new. Sports were difficult and I was very active in sports uh, because they didn't have a gym so we had to go to other places. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I played uh, basketball, football, baseball, really? and uh, ran track for Mumford. I was captain of the football and basketball team. Wow. And, my, and I still say my greatest athletic accomplishment was that I was voted the best athlete in the school in the senior year. And that's a, that's a little <laughs> teeny trophy, but I keep it out there very prominent because that's one I liked. But you even during... You still have friends from 
from high school? Oh, sure, <laughs> sure. Um, we just, well, first of all, I, I was first class president oh, yeah. of Mumford, wow. and therefore, with each reunion, they came to my office, I kind of sponsored the reunions, and so I remained close with that group of people, and plus several other friends. Uh, for the 50th, they spent over a year, almost monthly, in my office. A lot of time I was gone, but they were working about 30, 30 people planning our 50th reunion. That's incredible. Yeah, and they came, that group became so close together. Not only did they have a great reunion, but then they had a party after because they wanted to stay together. And I just got an email today that last weekend, they had a senior class trip <laughs> to Washington, which was our senior class, uh, about uh, 30 people went to that. My goodness. Um, and at my party, I had a party in Florida for my 70th, uh, I had a bunch of people from elementary school, high school. Amazing. And what made it especially nice, a lot of the people, although we were in the same class, never hadn't seen each other for years. But I was the linchpin, and so when they came, a lot of people got reunited uh, one high school, one uh, college friend that I just got reacquainted with in Florida. I hadn't seen in 50 years. And I had him to the party and other people that were at the party hadn't seen wow. him in 50 years. That's incredible. Him and her, she was a date of mine when she was 14 and then <laughs> married this guy in college and I hadn't seen him for 50 years. But even during those years in high school, uh, I was always, uh, uh, at odds with the teachers. Uh, not a uh, problem on grades, but on what they expected of me. And I had this independent uh, spirit. Uh, for instance, uh, Mumford decided they weren't going to have football in 11th grade, so I switched to Central and used uh, my aunt's dress, who lived right near there because I wanted to play football. Well, the principal, uh, Colonel Clark, heard of that at Mumford. And course brought me back and <laughs> gave me a, a great lecture and it was the, the time of the biggest scandal at West Point and he compared what I had done to the scandal at West Point. He was, wasn't very happy with me <laughs> but he brought me back anyway. Um, so they were, they were really great years socially, sports, academically well, and uh, I think I learned more playing those sports about life and people than I did in the academic part really? of high school. Really? Yeah, you because know, our, our, we had a mixed class, African-American, non-Jews, and it was almost equal. So you really learned to get along with people and had some run-ins mm -hmm. in the years uh, with, with some of the people. And there was some, uh, a little bit of anti-Semitism, but not much. Uh, in college, uh, it was a continuation of those same kind of things. Did you have? problems in college as well? No, I by college I did pretty well. Because I know you had Out three degrees. So Out I mean, yeah, outgrown, I mean I'd I'd outgrown <laughs> that, no. <laughs> but then I'd become more of a conformist. <laughs> and, uh, what did you major in in undergraduate school? Uh, business school. Uh -huh. So I got a BBA, then I got a, a, a law degree. Right, and then you have an MBA. Yeah, the MBA came about because uh, I had extra credit left over from BBA. And it was a combined program of law, so I got a bunch of advanced credits. So when I graduated law school, I needed uh, 12 hours to get my MBA. So that was kind of a bargain degree, mm -hmm. and I did that while I was working, because it's not like today. Then we were anxious to get out, get working. So sure. I, I did my undergraduate in three years, law school in three years, and I went out and I got my MBA at night school while I was working. Wow. Um, and while at Michigan, I played a little freshman football, and I... Uh, um, I know you were a fraternity man. Yep, secure, I was... Uh, Sigma Alpha Mu. Yeah, yeah. And that, I became an officer of that, and uh, we had a very excellent fraternity. We were rated the best uh, chapter in all of Sammy's. Uh, two out of three years that I was there, I was an officer. Uh, on campus, we were first in sports for a Jewish house, very unusual, <laughs> out of something like 42 fraternities, and we were second in academics. So that was, that was uh, pretty good. Was, you, was your family a religious family, or, or were you more? Uh, as I mentioned, my grandfather was uh, semi-Orthodox. He was, I think, Orthodox originally, and then his 
he assimilated more, he became less so. Mm -hmm. My Passover service has always lasted better than an hour <laughs> compared to mine at about 10, 15. Um, uh, my parents were pretty much as uh, the majority of, of people are today. Uh, you know, we went to shul, celebrated the holidays. I went to Yeshiva Beth Yehuda uh, for afternoon school. Mm -hmm. And talk about trouble, I was always in trouble there. <laughs> talk about <laughs> boredom. And so I, uh, I had a very negative experiences as, uh, um, with my Hebrew education. Well, it, it, it's interesting because in looking over your record, I see there is this theme of interest in Jewish education, mm -hmm. and even to this day, I know you're, yeah. you're very interested. Maybe it's because you had such a bad experience. No, that <laughs> that, that's true, because you, know, you are limited and governed by your experiences. And just using the example of the Yeshiva Beth Yehuda, a very bad experience, and watching my grandchildren dislike afternoon school as much, if not more, than I did. Uh, I'm working on a program now with Tel Aviv University. Mm -hmm. w and the theme of it is, why it's great to be Jewish. And it's aimed at 12-year-old kids. Really? Pre-bar mitzvah. And it's all based on the media that they use. So it's games playing. I have uh, games that, with an underlying subliminal theme of why it's great to be Jewish. And there's uh, mystery stories, and it's done with Tel Aviv University, and we have uh, schools in Mexico, Madrid, Detroit, New York, Denver, that are experimenting with this thing. But the, I don't know if it's gonna be successful or not, but it, it is what's going to be necessary in teaching in the next 20 or 30 years. The, the old methods plain don't work. Right. And so we have to develop things that the kids enjoy doing. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure it'll be successful in the long period, but I'm not so sure it will now. I didn't find a lot of written about it, but I knew it was a technological yeah. program yeah. That, that would appeal to young kids. I, yeah. I did read Well, that. I see my grandchildren, you know, if you have any, they're, no, playing, ga <laughs> they're playing games all the time <laughs> on their game machines, hour, hour and a half at a time. And that's what gave me the idea to let's give them games, same kind of games, but let's have a, a message within yeah. the game. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's, that's interesting. Now, the, the other, because you mentioned education, and again, it's a transition where we're limited by our experiences. When I graduated uh, law school, when it, I went in to work with Honeyman when there was only four lawyers here for about six months. Then I had an opportunity to join my father-in-law in the scrap business because he had bought a manufacturing business and he wanted me to try to run that. He was a scrap man, even though he was fresh out of school. So uh, it was uh, not, a, not an easy transition because I found my education, even though I had an MBA, BBA, and a law degree, didn't help me much in a manufacturing business. Hmm. And because of that, some 20 years later, uh, 25, and I'm sure you saw that no, in the record. University of Michigan. Right. Uh, I went up so. there in the 80s and said, you know, you guys aren't teaching uh, what's needed for business. And that's why when people graduate, they go into business, in the big companies, they all have their own training programs. I said, that doesn't make any sense. Why don't we join with business, find out what they want, incorporate it in our curriculum, and then when they graduate, they can go right into business and become active. They don't have to waste a year. That seems like a reasonable thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, but it, it sounds easy, but it was difficult because it involved cross-disciplinary training. And, and most universities are built on silos, mm -hmm. education, humanities, business. And what this took is uh, crossing those boundaries. And it was combining engineering, business, LSNA, into an MBA degree in manufacturing with a heavy dose of practical experience out somewhere in the world working on a serious assignment <coughs> in corporations. Uh, and that program's now been around 10 years. We have about 150 graduates, 150 in the program mm -hmm. uh, a year. And it's been uh, uh, a great success. Uh -huh. So much so that the university's uh, business school has now changed their whole model to the model of the TMI. Uh, so that's the m new model they're going to be using. Instead of case studies that they did before, they're going to use this more practical really? approach. And, and Must I'm, make I'm you active feel in that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a nice thing. To be so creative and inventive. Because obviously, yeah. when you were a kid, 
no one allowed you to. Uh, yeah. and, let your and, mind and I think that's probably the reason uh -huh. that I did have uh, uh, those difficulties early on. But you had a you had some sort of a communal Jewish experience growing up, though. You were mostly yeah. with kids that were Jewish. And yeah, because McCullough, Durfee, uh -huh. you know that that was our home milieu. Yeah. I mean, I didn't I didn't I wasn't even allowed to go down to the other end of the block because of some bad kids <laughs> down there. So I had to stay with <laughs> just. Them. Um, well, um, but the the Yeshiva Beth Yehuda experience was so bad that I really lost interest in Jewish by the time I went to college. Mm -hmm. That's why I got involved in uh, some of these other mm -hmm. things at the university. Well, I remember I was at the speech, and I, and I, I found it in your record here about the speech. Uh, you gave a really a phenomenal um, personal speech about what your, what your children were going to be like and, and how you were very concerned about it. And then you founded this commission on identity and mm -hmm. affili uh, affiliation. affiliation. So uh, I think you had some very creative ideas that had never been done before anywhere mm -hmm. in the country. Do you want to mm -hmm. talk a, a little bit about the... Um, I've always operated on the outer edge of the envelope. Uh, that's where I enjoy being uh, with new creative ideas. The problem with it is you have lots of failures because when you're out on the outer edge, some things work, some things don't. Uh, I related a, a couple that are working, but there were ones that uh, haven't worked. And the whole continuity and identity issue, the way it was approached, was mainly conversation and not action. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard uh, in within a federation to get funding and to get motivation to move in new and unusual directions. Uh, a good example of that is you know that I was chairman of the group that merged United yes. Jewish Appeal, UIA, CJF. <laughs> it took me six years to merge those. And it I was know. extremely difficult. Then I was the first chairman of the executive. Right. And it had a grand vision. And that goes somewhat to your question. Uh, to be able to do things that are beyond what any individual federation could do. That's the point of a UJC, of a national organization. Things like birthright, for instance. Um, uh, one of the areas that I wanted to get into with UJC was to train uh, 1,000, 5,000 teachers and Jewish professionals a year in existing programs in the university, but provide the funding, the coordination to be able to do that. Everyone says that's the number one need of the system. We just don't have enough. Uh, and even though all federations agreed to that, I could never put together the funding and the commitment mm -hmm. to move forward on that. Mm -hmm. And there were several other grand ideas such as that, which would affect continuities, certainly with Absolutely. good teachers. Absolutely. Um, uh, well, I, I think yeah, that, that just merging those two organizations must have Three. been. Oh, that's right. You're right. That's UIA right. included. UIA. Um, just merging them in itself was cataclysmic, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, in, in my business experience, um, I did a lot of merging, buying, selling companies. This was so much harder. <laughs> <laughs> I could put a merger together a year, year and a half, even a tough one, two years. <laughs> this took six years. And the reason was is when you eliminate Jewish organizations, you're also, to some degree, eliminating their history. And so you have people that are committed in their whole lifetime, a long time to that, and are involved in it currently. Sure, sure. And they, it's volunteer, and it's very meaningful, very emotional, and they really don't want to see their organization merged into another organization. Sure. And that's what made it uh, so difficult. And it was working with people, and as we know, the Jewish people are kind of ornery anyway. <laughs> and so it, a lot of what I had to do in the merger was working with the human factor and making people comfortable with it.
director say, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it. And then six months later, they would think, well, I'm not going to be president of such and such anymore. And so they kind of backtrack on what they had agreed to do. And that's why I did. put it together, come apart, put it together, <laughs> come apart. Uh, so it was difficult. Are you happy with what the organization looks like today? No. No, because we had a grander scheme for it, you know, a greater vision. Uh, one of the things that came across our desk after we did it was eliminate every genetic disease in the Jewish community. We had a gen geneticist case and for a couple million dollars of research. Within 10 years, there will no longer be any Jewish diseases, okay. you know, directly associated wow. with the Jewish other A lot of other diseases, but sure. not our unique diseases, which there was about 10 of them. Um, no appetite for the funding of it. I mean, I couldn't raise the money to be able to do something, you know, as significant as that. That would be incredible if that, yeah. if that happened. Yeah. And then, so when I say I was disappointed is because after my term of office ended, uh, there became great budgetary constraints, and the federations were pushing very hard on budget cutting. And so they cut out all the things that we had set up to be able to do this original thinking, Renaissance and Renewal, a special uh, trust for Jewish philanthropy, which was made up of mm -hmm. large donors, federations, uh, UJC, to be able to accomplish some of these things. Mm. Um, so that's, that's why I was disappointed. Uh, the one nice thing uh, that came out of it, and my main interest uh, from my background at UJA was to stabilize the dollars going to Israel because they had gone just in my time of involvement from the 60s down to the 40s and today into the low 30s. But the last five, four or five years, the total dollars going to Israel in all, it's simply because some, some is not direct allocation, some is in extra money coming out of the Federation, has pretty well stabilized. Mm -hmm. And I just saw that going down and down. Uh, so from that point of view, UJC was uh, successful, and they do serve the federations well. But I really wasn't too interested in a trade association. I wanted I had a grander scheme in mind. Hmm. Interesting. Well, maybe. And, and it may come back. The current uh, executive uh, president, uh, Howard Rieger, uh, now is trying to rebuild some of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because when you talk about going from the yeshiva and <laughs> to really an international yeah. star on the on the Ju Jewish yeah. scene. I mean, it's a incredible. So uh, it, it has been looking back a fantastic run. Yeah, and the things I've been able to do, business but Jewishly. Well, I, I looked in exciting. obviously in, in your records and saw that you started out in the junior division and then became hmm. president of that in 1964 and. Sixty-nine. I, I read about your trip to. Uh, 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 you were on a young leadership trip to, a, and you went to a concentration camp. Yeah. And so you had some early. Uh, yeah, I started out in young leadership, and I joined that more because I was a joiner. And not with any great Jewish commitment, but some of the mentors, people I looked up to in the community, were heavily involved in the community, so I just became involved. My former wife said, I'd, I'd join anything, AAA, doesn't <laughs> matter. Um, then I got involved through that, set up a program there t to put junior division members on, feder on boards of agencies, because I wanted to go on the center board. Because well, as a youngster, I'd s uh, I used to sneak into the center to be able to play basketball. So I said, okay, I'll give a little bit back. and. <laughs> I got on their board and, and over the years worked my way through to become president of the center, uh, treasurer of Jewish Family Service, all through that uh, junior, junior division. Uh, an interesting battle that arose was during the building of the current Jewish center. Um, the center was built. It was uh, a very poor design. In fact, uh, I was one of the few in favor of really suing the architect because it was not a functional building. 
and although we had 14,000 members on the day we opened, that quickly dropped to about nine or ten. And uh, the center was in deep financial trouble, as you know, as <laughs> I know, has been on and off for many years. But it was really in deep financial trouble. And one of the ways out was to build up the health club. And the only way we could do that is build another section of racquetball, handball courts, because those are the things that some members wanted to bring. And we felt with the charges that would kind of stabilize the income. But the community had just, uh, I think the original budget was nine, I think they had put in 12. And uh, Marty Citrin had been the building committee chair and uh, then president of the Federation. And Alan Schwartz was involved, Bill Berman was involved. Uh, from a Federation point of view, and I, I, the center came with a proposal to spend another million dollars on these courts. And that leadership would have no part of it because it just overspent. The budget was uh, big, big money at that time was $700,000 in the black, I mean in the red. So they weren't looking favorably upon the center. But uh, it's part of my responsibility, Hugh Greenberg, uh, because we saw that if, if we didn't put those courts in, we were going to have to shuttle about half the center. We were going to have to close it off, cut, cut down the utilities because it wasn't usable. So it came time for the board meeting. And uh, unusually, they had a night board meeting, which they didn't very often have at the center, and I had uh, gone to several of the board members and done some lobbying. It just so happened the ones I lobbied with were through my father-in-law, and they were quite elderly. So we had the board meeting at night as compared to usually having it in the <laughs> middle of the day downtown. We had it out here at night, and they went through the agenda, and about 10 o'clock at night, the subject came up. And you don't often see these kinds of debates at a federation board meeting, but mm -hmm. Uh, Hugh and I were pitted against uh, <laughs> the three very powerful officers of the Federation, uh, and some of those I had lobbied with were barely <laughs> hanging on <laughs> at 10 o'clock at night. They but were snoozing, huh? I think <laughs> we won that vote. It was something like 15 to 12, wow. which was highly unusual in favor of doing the building. And I distinctly remember thinking, well, that's the end of my Federation career. <laughs> Took these guys on, I beat them, and they're not going to be too favorable <laughs> to me to be involved in the Federation. Well, I was entirely wrong. Uh, Marty, Bill, nor Alan, ever, in any way or in any shape, ever held any of that against me. And I think that's a real credit to the community, you know, that we could have that kind of discussion. It was heated, and they weren't happy. But once we were done, the decision was made, we all moved on. Um, now, you, you mentioned the, the trip to the concentration camp. Yes. Uh, you took many uh, trips. I, I oh, yeah, yeah. But you've been to Azerbaijan and uh, yeah, you've well been A lot of those came later, but yes. the most important trip of my life was the concentration camps. It was uh, Metthausen. Uh, and that's, that's one that'll bring tears to the eyes. <laughs> uh, as, I, as I said before, my involvement was because I was interested in being involved, and there wasn't a great deal of Jewish uh, dedication, at least conscious Jewish dedication, let's put it that way. Maybe there was some from my grandparents, and et cetera. Well, it's nice to feel that you belong someplace. Yeah, you know? yep. And Jews are pretty good, so <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was enjoyable. But I, I, after the junior division, I got into the Young Leadership Cabinet. And Herb Friedman was created that, talk about creative guides, created that, and taught uh, all of us at a very young age. And his, his theme was, look, you're the younger generation. I want you guys to all take over the Federation system as you go, and I'm going to train you to be able to do that. And we had two, three-day-long seminars about Jewish history, what it meant to be Jewish, some of the things that happened to our people. And I had, had nothing like that because Hader School was not uh, that kind of experience. Right. And so it really got me thinking. And then when I got to the concentration camp, uh, Mauthausen, and I still tell the story today, and I looked around and I saw literally, not figuratively, a hundred ways that they were killing Jews, parachuting them off the end of the mountains, filling 
choosing uh, covering with water and leaving outside to freeze, electric fences, these kind of things where you hang. But I mean, doctor, you know, the, the whole pot, I mean, ones that you can't even imagine. Dismemberment, it was, it was horrible. And with the history I had of our people and standing there, I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm going to commit the rest of my life to being uh, a Jew and making sure this never happens. I'm going to have kids. I don't want this ever to happen again. And the way I think you do that is you stay organized and not be afraid to speak out anytime, any place. And uh, the ear in my 2020 hindsight is wonderful. The ear of that previous generation was no one really spoke out enough. There were some, but not enough demanding, uh, not enough pressure. We had, we had some political power, but we didn't use it or know how to use it, maybe. I know we could have bombed the concentration camps. We could have done a lot of things during the war very easily. Uh, and so I committed myself right then and there. And I would say I have maintained that to this day until I die of continuing involvement. The positions are only a way to carry that commitment out. Uh, it's not uh, an end in itself in any of the positions. It was just a way to do what I said. And even though I no longer uh, am directly involved at UJC, I'm still doing three or four major Jewish projects, the different being that they're m of my selection. Mm -hmm. And so I can be very comfortable in, rather than in an organizational, institutional way. Uh, but I'll continue doing these things. Well, that's good. I, I, I know, as I said, I looked and saw you, s you went on a lot of trips. Mm -hmm. But the one that also stands out besides the concentration camp is when you greeted 14,000 Ethiopian uh, people from. Yeah, so, so let me talk about that experience and how, because it's kind of the theme of this discussion, how it affected me later. Uh, I'm doing four things now in Jewish life. One, I'm helping Israel write a new constitution. They've asked a group I belong to to gather opinions of the North American Jewish community on things that affect the diaspora that are going to be in the Israeli constitution, when and if it's ever uh, completed. Most people think there is one, but there isn't a constitution. Uh, and there are critical issues. Who's a Jew? Uh, minority rights, religion, and state that we have a stake in. And the nice thing is, for the first time ever, the Knesset came to us and said, we'd like not your money, we want the opinions of world Jewry as we develop this new constitution. So that's one of the projects. And that's an incredible project. Oh yeah, and we just started it, and we had our first meetings in New York wow. with nine Knesset members uh, a month ago. And so that project's going, and we'll, s we'll be in Detroit and spread around the country. Because I'm, I'm reading, uh, I can quote you in here, um, you're talking about the concern about, before we had a concern about physical survival, mm -hmm. and now it's a concern about creative survival. Right. So here you are mm -hmm. working on a, a constitution. Yep. And that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah this is 1996. Yeah, yeah that and was a long time um, ago. You know, it mm -hmm. says we, we can't worry anymore about attacks from the outside, but only attrition from within. Yeah, yeah, let me come back to that, because that, that's, uh, well, well, one, well, one, one, I, one of those I, I was, uh, like tough things. I, I'll cover the, just the four that I'm doing now. So I'm doing that. Uh, second project that I'm doing uh, is uh, Tel Aviv University and this uh, games plane. I'm, I'm chairman of Tel Aviv University's uh, uh, American Council. But the reason I did that is because Itamar Robinovich, the president's a good friend of mine, but also they promised to work on this project uh, for me. So that's the, the second kind of commitment I have. The third is now I am spearheading something I'm trying to learn about the 21st century. It is a petition drive, uh, an open letter to the president saying make as your primary focus of your foreign policy a continuing uh, involvement in the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And uh, we have a web page and I'm trying to get hundreds of thousands of signatures on this letter to give the president the support and as a politician to know there's a lot of people behind him and some of these minorities that are out there talking left, right about negatives, there's a vast majority, some 70% of the American population that's behind wow. 
that initiative. So that's the, the, and that brings me to the fourth one, which goes back to my experience, which was another life-changing experience of meeting the Ethiopians. Uh, I think it was 92 when they came off the plane. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yes, it was, was a beautiful experience. And about a month ago, UJC came to me and said, we'd like to run uh, a separate campaign for the Ethiopians because they're second-class citizens in Israel. Uh, and we think with some money we can inter intervene and assist that. So I'm in the midst of doing my due diligence because I don't want to get back into the institutional kinds of battles I've had. So I've set criteria of specific programs, commitment by the federations, uh, um, theme of the campaign, and if they're willing to do that, and I'm having sure. conversations, I would take it on with a co-chairman, a very good co-chairman, who was on the tarmac with me when I met the people. Yeah. What and was she's it a like wonderful when woman. When they came off the plane. Oh, most moving experience of uh, my life. Talk about tears. Uh, this was the last plane. You had uh, a C-135 was the last plane. And they had some 747s, you know, with 1,200 people on it. This was a, a C-135. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they and whole end drops down because it's for tanks and trucks. Mm -hmm. And they open it up, and there are 250 people crammed into this thing, flying five, six hours in this vibrating plane. And standing next to me, of course, Jewish agency, prime minister, uh, these very tough pilots uh, that had been flying the plane. You know, there's nothing tougher than an Israeli pilot. And these people all came off. And they didn't run off like you or I probably would have done. They came off very quietly. They were gentle people. And they greeted some of their predecessors that were there. And they just, just they do cheek to cheek to cheek, not like the French, just <laughs> twice or us <laughs> once. They just kept doing that and very quiet. And then the last guy off was their Kesan, who was a rabbi. And he, he guy didn't say anything, but it was clear to everybody what he was saying was, you know, here I am. Uh, I brought my people back uh, after 5,000 years. Uh, and that's the kind <laughs> of experience that blows I your mind. i tears in my eyes. Yeah. And there wasn't a dry eye. I mean, these big, tough pilots that flew them. And the Israeli people, which I pointed out to them during my, I was in Israel last week, so doing some due diligence, but um, the reaction of the Israeli public was something probably never done before or after. They were so excited these with these people. They brought clothes, they brought food, because I followed them to the absorption centers and they had some wow. reconstructed out there. All the Israelis bringing everything. I mean, you couldn't stop them. Finally, they had to block the streets. There was so much there of the outpouring. Now, unfortunately, they weren't integrated into the society the way they should have been, and so we have the problem today. But that one month period was for the Jewish people, as good as Antebi. Hmm. Well, I understand so that. that that's how you're, <laughs> I'm going back, that's how that experience on the tarmac now brings me to a potential uh, responsibility now. But something that, where you can take it in, in your direction and with your creativity yeah. and your, right. your, your good thoughts and right. uh, ideas. Yeah, I, d I don't want, uh, yeah, I, I'm a consensus builder. Uh, I like to lead, but I like to lead with people who are following, and so you yeah. have to have some sense of consensus. And, and I'm perfectly comfortable with that, going around getting consensus. But once the consensus is done, everybody signs out. I want to do what they say, which is the great deficiency in the Federation system. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 we're going to do that. And they go back to the community and can't, can't get it approved or change their mind. I don't know. It doesn't happen. Hmm. Yeah, but the things that you're working on um, yeah. will really have great impact, a constitution yeah. or or right. better lives for Ethiopians. Yeah. Or I mean, it and and really it's fun. I mean, I enjoy, it's a little too much right now, but it's <laughs> fun in that it's stuff that I really enjoy doing. I mean, I led, I led a discussion in New York in our first meeting about a month ago on uh, religion and state and all the ramifications that means that we don't even understand. I had an ultra-Orthodox member of Knesset there, and I had a Shanui member there. And just listening to them and their views, and then how the American Jewish community react to them, fascinating. Wow. And so a most enjoyable kind of project. Wow. Um, 
I, I did want to touch upon when you were campaign chair mm -hmm. of this federation in 1982. Mm -hmm. There was an emergency campaign to help Israel raise money so that they could uh, protect themselves mm -hmm. against the PLO. Mm -hmm. And then just recently, you had an opportunity to meet face to face with uh, Mubarak and uh, uh, Assad, and I think you met with Arafat. Yeah, I met, met with Arafat. Uh, it, it was interesting because I worked so long in the Jewish community and from the campaign and the missions. And, but through the UJA, UJC experience, part of what you're doing is representing the federation system, maybe the American Jewish community, but certainly the federation system, to the government of Israel. So I have, the I have had the opportunity to meet with these people. And on the Arabs, I'm Mubarak several times, Arafat several times, uh, Abbas twice. Um, and and then a lot of the lesser players, uh, Sari Nuseva, uh, and, and ones that are quite prominent. The woman, um, Hanna Shwari, met with yeah. her a couple of times. And you begin to see these are people. You know, yes, they have political points, but there's, there's people. And on the Israeli side, I've had some kind of relationship with every prime minister uh, since Shamir. And I just had lunch uh, Monday with Sharon, with about six of us. Uh, and what was interesting about that... And so what did and he say? And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did tell this story, because um, about five years ago I had a, a bit of a run-in with him. He was part of the minority government, and it was my job as head of UJC to disinvite him to the General Assembly. And I had a nice thing to talk about and why things we wanted him to do, and we wanted the president to come. And, he had just walked up on the Temple Mount. A lot of people oh, thought he had ouch. started the Intifada. Yes, right. Uh, and so Chicago didn't want him. And so he, uh, I went through my whole spiel. And he looks at me, very smart man. He says, you're disinviting me, aren't you? <laughs> he says, I'll tell you what. He says, I'm going to give you 24 hours. By the way, he didn't remember this on Monday. But he said, I'm going to give you 24 hours. And at the end of 24 hours, I'm going to call in the world press. And I'm going to tell him that the American Jewish community now supports the Palestinians in Arafat. And they're trying to uh, um, undermine the minority in Israel. Legitimate, I mean, they're trying to delegitimize de us. Well, needless to say, I went back to Chicago, called special <laughs> meetings, and within 24 hours it had changed, and I introduced him as our guest at the General Assembly. But he then went on for an hour and a half after that and talked about his view of Arab-Israeli relations and what he would do if he were prime minister. You know, and he, he would boot it out of the government a couple of times. He didn't have a lot of credibility. So I really wasn't buying it. And I told the story on Monday. I said, of all the prime ministers, Rabin and some good ones, you're one of the only ones I know of that said, here's what I'm going to do. And that's exactly what you've done in your five years in office. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's given me, you know, that continuity over the years to be able to have those kind of relationships, and through that uh, involvement with the, the presidents of the United States as well. Uh, it's, and it's been a good run. I think it, I'll give you one example where, you know, maybe it was uh, some good, because Max had did a, tr Fisher has done a tremendous amount of good in the political arena. And he taught me early on, he said, get involved in politics. Even though you're on the Democratic side, get involved <laughs> in politics. Well, we had a problem in uh, Azerbaijan. And we had a Jewish agency group there that was bringing Jews out, and the government uh, of Azerbaijan decided they were going to throw the Jewish agency out because they didn't want all this uh, disturbance. They were having enough trouble. So I was in a meeting with the president uh, with a group of Jewish leaders, and they were all, you know, jockeying for position. And I knew Clinton pretty well. And so towards the end, he said, "Yo, what do you, you know? What's on your mind?" I said, "Well, we've got this problem." in uh, Azerbaijan, and they want to throw our people out. And we're rescuing people there, people that have a right to go to Israel. And I could use some help. And he turned uh, Madeleine Albright and uh, Berger were sitting there. And he said, do you know anything about this? And they said, no. He said, well, he says, this is an exact quote. He said, I have some markers out on uh, Alawai, I think the president of uh, Azerbaijan. He said, let me see what I can do. And this was on a Thursday. On a Sunday, following Sunday, I got word from Israel that they'd called in the Jewish agency 
and said, hey, you got some, you got some help from pretty high up. He says, I think you can stay here, and they worked out the situation. So that's... Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's what you can do when you're involved in the political process, because there are those who criticized me when I was head of the uh, UJC for my political involvement with Gore, with Clinton, the uh -huh. Democratic Party. But I never used my UJC position as part of that. I was there as an American citizen. Nonetheless, there were those that criticized me totally incorrectly because you can accomplish it. You don't want to use UJC. Right. But I mean, as an individual, system. you can affect. Maybe in some little minor way, mm -hmm. Max, uh, uh, during the Ethiopian crisis that week, uh, called the President Bush at that time. And he called the Ethiopian uh, rebels who were on the outskirts, if you remember, that's why we mm -hmm. rescued 12,000 right. in the weekend, mm -hmm. and got them to hold off going in till the Monday so we can get the people right. out. Right. Max did that. I was there. I saw it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. We, we had to pay $25 million on the Wednesday. I was going to say, there was a little price to yeah. that, but... And we, we never uh, know what happened to that money, by the way. But anyway, we, we came up with the $25 million. We don't know if the new government got it or the old government. But it took us about two days at UJA. Because you know, UJA, we didn't go through process. <laughs> 25 million, rescue our Jews, we came up with the 25 million and, uh, and rescued them. So there, it, the political, my political involvement from, I was with APAC when APAC was two people, delivering checks to congressmen and senators. Uh, that's got to be 30, 40 years ago. Wow. It's important. Wow. Very important. Well, according to the record, I mean, you've been involved since the early 60s, so... It's, I want to say, years. 40 years. 45 years. Yeah. yeah 40 years. Yeah. You've been around. Yeah. <laughs> but again, always, uh, I mean, the jobs of campaign chairman in Detroit, Federation president, were the best. They were so much fun because you had more direct contact with people and you could implement your policies and your own ideas. On the national scene, it's way more powerful. Uh, not at UJA. UJA was a uh, was a ball because we had we had believe it or not about sixteen people running UJA, mm -hmm. and we just made the decisions and went off ran emergency campaigns, ran regular campaigns, uh, and we just went out and raised money. The Exodus campaign we raised nine hundred and twenty million dollars to bring out a million two hundred and fifty thousand people from the former Soviet wow. Union and the eighty thousand from Ethiopia. I mean, who ever heard that? Yeah. You know, in, in the incredible. history of mankind. It's incredible. Go back all the way in history. One group of people helping a million two hundred and fifty thousand yeah, incredible people yeah. from the former Soviet Union to the United States and Russia. And they're people we didn't know, had no relationship with because there was the Iron Curtain, and came up with nine hundred and twenty million dollars to do it. What kind of people are we? Yeah, it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. It's just uh, yeah. amazing. And how we changed the nature of Israel. Those million Russians changed Israel totally, economically, culturally, for the good. And there was some bad, you know, there's Russian mafia and others <laughs> there. But by and large, it was a great, great influx of people for Israel. Well, being at the helm of those organizations is, you know, must have been an incredible rush yeah. to, to be at, at the head when you, you rescue people from yeah. Syria or Sarajevo or... Yeah. There was a high. You know. And, and, you, and you go see them. Uh, in 89, I took my two stepdaughters, Shelley's two kids, uh, to the younger one, to be bar mitzvah at the wall. But before I took her, I wanted her to go on the same path as the Russians we were rescuing. So Shelley and I and the two girls went to Russia, met with some of the people that were leaving, went to Vienna, where they, if you remember, they transmigrated to La Dispoli. Right. Then I took them to La Dispoli. And they saw the people as they moved through, you know, what Jews do with other Jews. And we had trouble because of La Dispoli. Should they come here? Should they go there? There was big fights yes, in the right. Jewish community. Who wants to go to but Israel? Who wants to come to the yeah, U.S.? Yeah. Well, most wanted to come to the United <laughs> States, but we were not letting them in. And then I took them and got bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah at the wall. Oh, my yeah. goodness. What and an incredible experience. Yeah. Yeah, but because wow. uh, you were talking about passing it on to yes. the next generation, that's how I chose to do it. And with my three kids, I've been to Israel many times, part of UJ mission. Mm -hmm. My son and three of his best cousins were bar mitzvah at the wall. 
Uh, and now next year, I'm hoping, uh, God willing, they'll take four of my grandchildren that are 12 and 13. And they'll have their regular bar mitzvahs, right. but I want to take them to the wall. And it's something that I know you have is five, meaningful. Five children and 10 grandchildren? Nine. Nine. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's hard to remember everything <laughs> because your curriculum vitae and everything is just uh, so full of, of different yeah. things. In, in all, all phases of life, and I speak about this with the young leadership of Federation. I just had a meeting with, what do they call this group? Uh, oh, a legend. Like the, yes. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. And I've had, and I, I, because of that, I went back and looked how many times I spoke to the to the uh, young leadership cabinet and uh, the young adults division here. It was 13 times in the last uh, 15 years. And the theme always is uh, you have to prioritize in life. And the priorities are clear, always been clear to me since maybe 19 or 20. One family, two business, three because my dad died very young for me, physical fitness, four philanthropy, five social. And I have maintained since I was 20 those same priorities. What changes is the amount of time you have available, but not to change in priorities mm -hmm. because in the early years it's all family and business. You're trying to get ahead and a little bit of the others. Uh -huh. Athletic I always did because of my dad and I enjoyed it. And then now later in life it's mainly philanthropy, but still business, still family. And it's very important to keep that perspective. And I warn these young people. Don't distort it. I've seen people lose their businesses because they got too involved. I've seen divorces because they got too involved. Balance. Mm -hmm. Patience, perseverance, as Max always said. <laughs> There's plenty of time. Do you want to uh, talk a little bit, because you mentioned that you were there at the signing when mm -hmm. Clinton and uh, Arafat yeah. and uh, Levine were all together mm -hmm. on the White House lawn, and it's one of the treasures you have in your office. Yeah, yeah. Because I was involved in politics, and I was always interested in politics, uh, I've supported Carl and Sandy, for instance, since the day they took office, uh, even when Sandy ran for governor. That was a long time ago. Um, so I had a natural tendency. So mm -hmm. I got involved through my other positions in, especially in later years, in the politics of Israel, politics of the United States, with my primary emphasis on peace. Uh, at least some kind of agreement in the Middle East. And as I told you, I made that commitment to myself in the concentration camp. And this, of course, was the ultimate, if we could bring those two people together. So it's always been a primary focus. And that's why I met with Arafat and Mubarak, always, I'm just an, as a private individual trying to help the process. That's why I'm doing this petition drive. You know, I don't know, is it going to be helpful? Is it needed? I don't know, but it can't hurt, right. and it's an easy thing to do, I think. So I started out as a dub. You know, people are people. You sit down, you talk to them. Uh, you give them something, they give you something. I buy and sell companies, you negotiate, and you make it happen. Ah, terribly naive, <laughs> <laughs> terribly naive. <laughs> And over the years, because I had those conversations with Arafat, and I learned he, in, and I am 100% convinced, he never intended to have a peaceful settlement with Israel. He was looking for the uh, dem demographic changes, and he was looking for the Arab world to support him in a war against Israel. And his, uh, he said it many times back in the 60s when they formed it, and he never really left it, if you look at what he's saying, because he wanted to wipe Israel out. Put him in the state. The Jews could live in the Palestinian era if they wanted, but it was going to be a Palestinian state. That was his objective. Uh, so, uh, a lot of the things we were doing, and you know, I wasn't able, but so was the President of the United States. Clinton had Arafat to the White House more than any other head of state during his term of office. Oh, I didn't know that. That's oh, yeah, by far. Uh, because Clinton is the same kind of guy, you know, he thinks he can talk anybody into anything. He's smooth, understands people. You couldn't with this guy. Uh, and so I didn't, I never became a hawk, but I certainly moved into the center. Uh, and uh, quid pro quo, and a lot of the things that, even though I didn't agree with it five years ago when I had that meeting with Sharon, I certainly agree with it today. 
And I think his policies have brought us to the point we're at now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I think there's a real opportunity now. And I wrote an article in the Jewish News just recently about this is, uh, this is good an opportunity, mm -hmm. as I've seen. And therefore, everybody has to do, and I said in the article, everybody, Arab countries, Europeans, Russians, United Nations, all have to really contribute if they're going to bring this thing together, because that's the kind of efforts it's going to take. There's too much hatred. The parties can't do it. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me talk a little bit about my speeches in 99, because I went around the country, and I probably gave 50, 70 speeches. You know. Maybe that's an idea. Yeah, one a week, maybe. And my theme was, it, we've reached the golden era of the Jewish people. We had just left Lebanon. The world was basking in, in uh, praise of Israel. Uh, Anti-Semitism was at a minimum. Uh, we were the most prosperous people in the history of the Jewish people in North America. Israel's GNP was growing. We had done the Exodus campaign. There was, I don't know, at that time, probably four million, four and a half million Jews in Israel. And everything was great. And I remember talking about that. And I said, we never, no longer have to worry about our survival. We don't have existential problems now. Now it's quality. What are we going to distribute to the world? We have uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners. We're active in government, Kissinger, et cetera. Anywhere you looked, Jews were playing a prominent role. And we weren't being attacked as a people anywhere in the world. It looked pretty good. So I went around speaking about that. <laughs> and we have to get creative and those kind of things. Of course, then we hit the Intifada. Anti-Semitism increased. And we're back where we always were. And once again, I prove relatively naive. And you have to understand that we're a minority wherever we are. Uh, we've had difficulties in our 3,000-year modern history. Uh, and we always have to understand and protect ourselves and guard against those kinds of conditions. We'll have good periods, Spain, golden era, and then it will turn bad. And it, could it happen in the United States? Of course, it can happen in the United States. Uh, will it? I doubt it, but it could. And therefore, as a people, we have to stay very strong. And one of the things I said to Sh Sharon, because he also believes that, any agreement with the Palestinians, uh, and uh, hopefully there will be one, is not one that you can count on. It's not an agreement between Canada and the United States. Uh, and because I think their view of the Palestinians is the same as Arafat's view, and that is we don't want you here, and they have a long history of patience, crusaders, Turks, etc., they'll outweigh us. And therefore, no matter what the agreement is and how good it may get, and I have hopes that the societies will work together over the next 20, 30 years, and some of that will go away, uh, Israel must stay strong. They must keep a qualitative edge in their military and have to stay strong, depend. Our history proves you can't depend on those kinds of things. <laughs> that, that was, uh, I, I, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because I think it's important. Well, it's interesting that you've admitted that sometimes you actually even change your opinion and, oh, you sure. know, change your thoughts. Well, and you have to or you die. Yeah. You know, I mean, things change, conditions change. If you're not flexible, um, well, that's it's not much good. It's true. It's, it's, very it's true. creative mind. It's very true. Do you want to comment at all about your family or say a few words about your Sure. Sure, as you mentioned, I have five kids, nine grandkids. Uh, I'm a, a typical example in that my oldest daughter married uh, a non-Jew, uh, got divorced uh, five or six years ago. But the children from that marriage are not very Jewish. I do the most that I can, but if it's not in the home, uh, it, it's difficult. So I don't know when they make the decision, whether they make a decision to be Jewish or not. Mm -hmm. My other six grandkids, they're a result of uh, Jewish homes. Mm -hmm. uh, and my kids, from, uh, from the things that I did with them, not because I said it, but because of the missions we went on and took them on retreats, and I, th I think uh, you do some of that, and yes. did some of that kind of thing yes. as well. Uh, 
they all have a great Jewish consciousness, more than I had early on. So that my, uh, both my daughters in New York are involved with the Federation, involved in other uh, Jewish charitable fundraising efforts. But because they're in the midst of raising their kids, they're not real active. My son, who moved on to San Diego, to my great dismay and fault, because I sent him there to run one of our companies, uh, got very involved in the Federation. And it, even though he was only there a couple of years, they made him campaign chairman. Uh, and he's on the Young Leadership Cabinet. And a lot of the same kind of things that I did, he's doing. Even though, I must say, and because we're extremely close, uh, I advised him against taking <laughs> the chairmanship because he had little kids, starting a business, all these other things. But he decided to go ahead. It was fine with me. But after a year, he decided not to renew for a second year. <laughs> It was a, a little too much. That's a lot of work. Yes, yeah, so sir. And, and yeah, you've it was a lot of work. You've been working throughout many, many years. Yeah. yeah for me, it's years. habit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I look at, why am I doing this, you know? <laughs> but I think you enjoy it. No, I don't know <laughs> I enjoy it. Sometimes I do try to do too much. So, yeah, Jewishly, I'm very proud of my kids. I'm very, very proud of the way they're raising their families. My nine grandkids, of course, are great, beautiful intelligent, <laughs> all the things, and they really are. Well, why not? They come and from, uh, from a great-grandfather. Yeah, <laughs> but it doesn't always work out that way, you know. Any, uh, any so secrets th that we should know about? Uh, yeah, probably. Secret thoughts, uh, uh, wishes, the desires? The best is my marriage to Shelley uh, has put me into uh, situation that's uh, beyond belief in now relationships. Now you're going to make me cry. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and it's, it's true. I mean, it's uh, my first uh, marriage uh, and Shelby was, was and is a wonderful person, but our personalities clashed all the time. Not her fault, not my fault, but they clashed. In this marriage, it's total compatibility. I mean, a hundred percent. We've never had an argument in 22 years. You know, we've had discussions, but never an argument. She's still mad at me now because <laughs> I posted it. <laughs> but um, I'm going to do a mission of mercy with her, with her former husband at one o'clock, so she should take a little Vachmon assignment. <laughs> but she's uh, just been a supportive, uh, wonderful uh, wife in everything that I do. And although she d never wants to take the forefront, she's behind the scenes and encouraging me, encouraging me yeah. to do some of these things that, well, you know, maybe I ought to do it. She goes, you know, maybe, maybe you ought to do it. <laughs> uh, so that uh, has just been uh, a tremendous joy to me. I was, I was sort of surprised at how long you've been married because yeah. you seem like newlyweds. Right. <laughs> I feel like a newlywed because it, it is I that I way. looked in your folder That's and what it is. You know, I, c I yeah. could tell by the addresses where yeah. you were living at certain right. times in Huntington Woods and such. And yeah, it, uh, there you are. It's, it's beyond, it's really beyond belief uh, that we've been so fortunate. And we both cherish it, and probably some of that comes from yeah. first marriages. So <laughs> and a lot of my major speeches, I remember one at UJA, I said uh, the, something like, the Jewish people will never be separated from Jerusalem, and I'll never be separated from Shelley. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. <laughs> that, was a, you know, good, that was a pretty good one. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, and, and the nice part was I meant it all the time. Uh, but I have a personal comment, and uh, this is a bit sad, but in redoing my offices uh, in the past two weeks, I've been reorganizing my pictures. I told mm -hmm. you, I remember Rebellion, stuff like that. And I had probably the half a dozen people who play the biggest role in my life, men that have played the biggest role. Um, and were the most loyal, dedicated to everything that I did. Yeah, I think there were six, and five of them are gone. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, very sad. Max Fisher certainly played a major, major role in everything that I did, uh, and tremendously supportive uh, person. And my brother-in-law, Ken DeShell, 
Do you remember Ken? Yes, I certainly do. We were in business yes. together, spent all the years. During the divorce, he stayed in the business with me and supportive and helpful. Uh, my father and my father-in-law. Uh, and David, Hermelin. We were friends since we were six years old. And a lot of those trips that you were talking about, mm -hmm. he was right at my side. We were together in everything we did. And he was one of those guys that uh, I was on the same wavelength. Again, almost like my wife. There's never, you know, we, we did things together. It was not a competition. And the other and the only one alive is Marv Lender, oh, yes. who is like a brother in that, uh, and we do, we're doing this Constitution project, and we do a lot of things oh, really? together and business together. I remember him from UJA and yeah, stuff. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, uh, the nonverbal communication is extraordinary. I mean, we'll be in a meeting, and we're thinking exactly the same thing. <laughs> and he'll say something, or I'll say it, doesn't matter. It comes out the same. And uh, those kinds of relationships are unique. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I don't have 50 close friends. Well, I had a couple hundred at my, my uh, party. <laughs> but for those kind of relationships, they're very special, very important to me. Well, they, I think it's a wonderful way to end this tape. And thank you very much. Uh, okay. uh, this has been really a great thrill for me to be able to interview you because uh, I look at you as one of my mentors. Oh, thank so, you. Uh, thank right. you again. And it's it's interesting that you didn't even have to interview me. I got told the whole story <laughs> <laughs> anyway. No, but, but thank I, you so much. It I, was really I helpful. got a thrill out of I was seriously reading all of the things that you've done. I th I don't think people understand the expanse of, no. of your It's, it's a little stuff. I'm, I'm and I like it that way. I'm behind the scenes. Yeah, but it's good. Working. It's really wonderful. Yeah. You know, so. I find I can get a, and Max did too, you can get a lot more done behind the scenes. If you're out front, people are going to take shots at you. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're behind the scenes, you can maneuver, you can make things happen. You don't have to just do it for a uh, show. You're not impressing anybody doing it back to the old commitment at the concentration camp. It's all That's right. Well, we're Thanks. gonna have to interview you five years from now yeah. and find out how the all the wonderful projects yeah. are that you're doing yep. and what you're up to next because uh, it's just a beginning. Yeah. Well it's a continuation. Continuation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good.